Uh, hi, I'm Rich. Um, welcome to my talk. So this is Umbracademia, uh, me writing a dissertation about Umbraco. So uh, we're going to follow a Studio Ghibli style five act structure. So we've got our background, our problem, our solution, our learning and our reflection. This is probably going to overrun very slightly. Uh, irritatingly, the more that I've spoken to people, the more evident it is that there's quite a lot of discussion and questions that people might have. So if I talk quickly or skim over slides, then apologies. So starting off with the background. Hi. Um, so this is me from about a week ago before I'd shaved and I'm a cloud based musician and developer. Um, I'm a cloud software engineer at a startup called Nightingale HQ and I've recently submitted my masters in uh, computing. I almost forgot what I did it in. Uh, dissertation, which is what this talk is about. Yay. Um, so to give a quick timeline, 2021, I left my career as a professional musician and I started a conversion course at Cardiff University, which other people in this room have done, and it's a wonderful thing. Uh, in 2022, I started my placement with Nightingale HQ, and that was a .NET job, and that was the first ever .NET job that I've really come across or had. Uh, only prior experiences really with Unity, and I pretty much took the job so that I could learn to use Unity better. Um, and now I learned that, like, you know, .NET is a thing. Who knew? Um, and then at the beginning of 2023, I found out what a bracket was, largely through word of mouth, recommendations of people that I liked, liking it, Carl Saguna being a good example, my manager Chris being another. It just seemed to be one of those things that people I liked, liked it. Um, so I finished my placement with Nightingale, and then you do your dissertation. And for that, I was able to then do my dissertation for Nightingale, which was an Umbraco theme thing. So kind of like went full circle. Quick explanation, Nightingale uh, HQ, or NHQ as they'll be shown up. Um, Cardiff, Stroke Island based startup. There are three people, myself being one of them. Um, we do digitalization services for the manufacturing sector, um, and we focus on .NET. We're pretty much a .NET house. Um, the other people in the company who aren't me are Ruth and Chris, so CEO and CTO respectively, uh, who are both great. Um, so we currently have a website and this is what it looks like. It is what is currently online, uh, the dissertation project I'll be talking about is not, uh, at nightingalehq.ai um, and it hosts news, blogs and contact details for us. It's pretty much very, very straightforward standard things. So the problem, our current website built upon Hugo and Netlify CMS Hugo being a static site generator written in Go, and Netlify CMS being a headless CMS written in JavaScript. Um, just to give you a quick explanation of how the static site generation works, you actually the authors write their content in Netlify. That then becomes a markdown file. That uh, a GitHub action then renders that uh, in via Hugo to create the web front matter, and that is then um, hosted. This is just kind of static architecture in general. Um, so, a couple of problems for us. Uh, pretty much this is a, a you know a, a simplified thing of the fact that we are a .NET house and this is a bit of Go technology and we don't particularly use Go for anything else within our company. So using Go templates versus Razor templates is a slightly like confusing thing. And Netlify CMS is really bad for us. Um, it, you, we just had so many issues in general with the editor experience. Um, and it's also, if this infrastructure was created by staff who are no longer with the company, which is kind of a standard thing for startups in a sense but is an interesting problem of longevity. So possible solutions to Nightingale HQ current website. Um, for, the port <laughs> for the Netlify experience, we could look into customizing Netlify more. We could try and engage more with that. For the Go templates, we could just learn Go. But again, we are quite busy and it's a whole other thing. And um, an interesting side to this is that if uh, this project was done now, I would probably explore it more with Umbraco 12 in a headless kind of way and look into kind of Umbraco 12 plus Hugo. I think that might be quite interesting, aside from the aforementioned templating issue. And also the fact that we could try and just go back and look over stuff. But instead, I uh, decided to set fire to all of that. And so replace uh, everything using Razor and changing the entire editor experience and create an entire new website where we could actually be more on, to on top of what's going on rather than trying to look into the past. And that brings us to our good friend Abraco, and that's pretty much what my attestation was. It was to migrate uh, the migration of, of uh, Nightingale HQ's website from Hugo to Umbraco CMS v10. Hi, Owen. <laughs> <laughs> Solution. So this was project structure, um, project structure breakdown that I put together for this project. 
I mean, the thing is, this was a project for, of just me. So it's a, I, a lot of this ended up being um, learning about project management techniques, which I'm really interested in. So you'll see lots of them done in a very poor and amateurish way, but that's the kind of the learning. All right, um, so it's sort of split into eight sort of sections here. Document in the current website, understanding the current website, creating the front, front end replica of the current site because we're sort of trying to create a like for like uh, matching of it. That got cut pretty quickly because we decided that they didn't like the current website. So why should I bother spending time recreating something we're just gonna get developers to redo? Bring on February, but I've only just found out about that. So I'm really happy that we're actually gonna do that properly. Um, you know, building the back end just to make sure it matches what we're expecting. Migrate the database, a fun thing when you have a static site generated thing because you don't have a database, you have markdown files. Um, so that's a really fun thing to migrate from nothing to SQL. Um, developer uh, CI/CD, uh, architect the infrastructure, and just create the web matter. Um, use case diagrams, yay! Uh, so yeah, just highlighting the fact that realistically we have currently very basic usage for our own site. What this doesn't really show is the fact that one of the real draws of using something like Umbraco is its extensibility, the fact that we're able to create more like rich, I hate that word, but still richer user experiences and you know dynamism, etc. But as far as we're concerned, this is just kind of how it works. We have you know writers, editors, publishing, searching, blah, all this kind of malarkey, and this is what we just followed. Um, here is a kind of very dry like for like of what were the current versus the new was. Moving between Hugo to ASP.NET, uh, uh, Go to Razor, nothing to SQL, a static to dynamic, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as uh, these last three are kind of uh, might draw some questions, um, in general, at Nightingale HQ, we actually tend to prefer ASDO, um, Azure DevOps, than GitHub. So we typically just use that more. So that was kind of interesting to kind of utilize, but that's certainly the most kind of, why didn't you do it that other way? And it's like, it's just a kind of a decision within the company. Um, here was the project timeline I put together for myself. Um, I, uh, so pretty much the entire project uh, was meant to be 12 weeks. Uh, for personal reasons, I actually had an extension, which is why there's a 13th week at the end. Um, my favorite thing is if you look at sprint three in the middle there, my goal of sprint three is learn on Braco. Um, so one of the really fun things, I mean, that's, that's pretty much, that's one of the fun things because I, my background within the Umbraco community starting from January is realistically community first. Like I've gotten to know the events, I've attended stuff, and I've given talks which are far more about almost philo like philosophy or learning practices or kind of like process mapping and whatever, um, but actually haven't really engaged a lot with just using Umbraco. And that was a, a fun, I mean, the reason I did this project was to force myself to actually learn it and do that properly. So uh, bless poor planning me of Sprint 3 of just just having non-stop Paul Seal tutorials on the whole time, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and this is roughly uh, followed. A kind of interesting part, I think, in terms of the planning was that I prioritized making sure that any of the CICD and the actual cloud infrastructure was set up well in advance of anything else. Like I knew what would go into it. Sorry. Yeah, I knew what would go into it, so I had an idea of what parts needed to be done. But because that, in my opinion, can be such a source of woe and tears, I decided to really prioritize getting that right from the go so I could just click the button because that caused many tears and it was horrible, but we did it. Uh, front end initially in scope, then we decided we want to redesign, so we moved it from scope. And um, though the aesthetics of what is currently there pretty much are just the clean package, which is Paul Seal's implementation of clean blog. Um, so even while, so on the left is what the current site looks like and on the right is just the new one I did. I've just included this to show that I kind of tried to copy what was going on in a rough kind of almost dark mode like mode sort of manner, um, but that wasn't really the focal point of what we're talking about. Infrastructure, um, here was the very, very basic infrastructure I just made, uh, so this is an Azure one. Um, uh, you know, have a local develop, uh, help, local database, push to Asdo, push to a static um, app, and then hold on, uh, and then hold uh, within a uh, Azure SQL database that is there. The most hilarious uh, thing that I just couldn't get working was Azure storage locally, just for some reason that just didn't work for me. Um, and so I actually ended up using the same storage account both for production and development. And that only became a problem when at Code Cabin, the internet went down and I then couldn't run so many things on my site. So I, yeah, so that was a fun thing of learning how to remove storage very, very quickly. Um, here is a blog post of me complaining about stuff not working in terms of CI/CD things and quite regularly updated one, two, three, all the way down to six. and. Yes, it was a bit of, it was a nightmare as I expected, but again, that's just me. Um, ran into just this five, five, 500 point, 
3.0 issue all of the time and it was really, really fun. Um, but we got through it and this is what the ultimate actual pipeline and um, the ammo looked like, which was nice. Um, yeah, this was a particularly part, this was a particularly arduous part of the process that I, I want to write more up on. Uh, any DevOps experts probably actually know exactly what they're doing, but I did not, and I wish that more people did. Um, document types, this is pretty much just highlighting the fact that the website, in its essence, was just a detail list and some generic content pages where you could just make some extra bits and pieces. Um, not really too much to see, it's just highlighting we've got a blog, a careers page in a day, knowledge base, landing, newsroom. There are quite a lot of list pages which then had articles. We've got a particularly um, large knowledge base page of about 200 blog articles of just like what is Azure and stuff like that. Um, so again, this largely following kind of like, you know, compositions and, and utilizing a lot of the design tools uh, from the Atomic Design Talk, from uh, Mark Goodson and from uh, Lee Callagher. Um, that particular code, cabin, uh, code garden talk is still infamous to this day and I love that it's still available. Uh, packages used, so super quickly, which one's this? Contentment and this one, Usync and this one, that's clean. Uh, and this one, Accessibility Reporters. This is a new one which I actually found out from on Bristol because uh, Matt did this and gave a talk on it and I think it's the greatest thing ever. Just gives you a quick back office check going through some of the um, um, <coughs> some accessibility things and it's really, really good. So honestly, do check that out. Uh, God Mode, uh, Skybrod Redirects, IDDQD and also uh, SEO Toolkit. And this is kind of the package you use for this, a pretty standard bunch of free tools. Uh, the data migration tool, or as I realized when I was writing this, this could be in the damn it, and I really wish I'd have realized that earlier on. Um, but this was pretty much the largest bit of actual coding I ended up doing. Um, so controllers were made for both uploading of the media files and of the actual uh, the content creation. Um, in a bit, there'll be a slide showing the the way that Hugo create, or the way that Netlify CMS creates blog articles are to just have a folder where there's a single markdown file and any related media files there. So basically the process, and we'll talk about this, was to scroll through each of those files, upload, you know, upload the any of the related media, you know, creating its own kind of folder path, and then going through those markdown files, identifying what you need to do. I only realized I could uh, call this damn it when I was making this uh, presentation. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yes, and this is the slide I was talking about. So just to give context, that is what a blog article looks like from our current website. So it's just every folder and there's going to be some random image and an index markdown. Um, that's, that's literally how um, Netlify CMS works. Um, so, yes, so this is just a case of going through get off setting. Um, so for the, uploading the media, using the media service, going through each of them exactly as I just described, get off setting a folder, finding any images, uploading them. And then the actual hard, far more complicated part was that this was a, an example of one of the markdown files. So specifically all of the markdown files, the actual content itself, split into this head and this body section, which is kind of delimited by this, so like three hyphens there. And you just get this free, well, I mean, freely created head with all of these different attributes in that sort of manner. Um, and so what I ended up having to do was to identify each of those, so to know that, okay, so we're looking for a title, that'll be title, and you know, or tags, that's always going to be on the next line, so we then have to break that down until we've got something which doesn't start with a hyphen, etc. And then the body itself um, is, an, is a really interesting thing, because of how because of how bad Netlify CMS was, or moreover, how poorly we treated Netlify CMS, I should say, we ended up making quite a lot of use of um, AMP components or accelerated mobile pages. And so that means that the way that we would actually get functionality like iframes or like nesting YouTube things was to just code it like into the rich text editor, to just copy and paste in like the AMP tags like that, um, or like a YouTube thing like this. So that ends up being displayed in the body in this kind of way. So what ends up having to do with sort of crawling through these things is to kind of identify what's going to be text, then identifying, oh wait, we started a, an AMP component, so we're going to have to then identify what kind of AMP component it is, because there are about eight of them. I think that's the next slide. Yeah, so uh, that's showing six. Um, and these, these AMP components, you know, there are a lot of them. And so what I ended up doing was creating rows in the block list editor, which represented each of those components. So then you could just leap through and identify, okay, cool. So if I've seen an AMP 
slash image, that's going to eventually be an image row, and then creating the, um, the appropriate kind of translations between those two things. Um, and here's what some of them look like, just for clarity. Um, and so basically the way that this ends up working in terms of actual like you know, dev work is that we've created a page content class which is made up of a header um, and the header itself has a list of all the possible attributes which could be there so like the title of the author or having a list which could be tags etc etc and then so to kind of pass through the head and then in the, the body, the body is then made up of a list of rows, so including like a markdown row, um, uh, the image iframe, carousel, button, audio, etc. And so they all inherit from the iRow interface, and then you can create, like, you know, say, like i audio row, which then goes off that, which just gives a way of kind of handling them and being able to create the body content as being this list of i rows, which then gets um, iterated over to actually create the appropriate block list editor. Um, and that's, this is just what I said basically, so the fact that block list editors, when you're creating them just from JSON, you have to like uh, account for layout, content data as a, an array, and settings data as an array. Um, my favourite, or possibly least favourite thing, was that in the documentation they just tell you how to create like a layout object and a content data and a settings data um, from scratch in JSON, and it's like, oh cool, so just add these things. And I took it to Lee Callagher, and he was like, oh, those, those are already strongly typed. Those are already defined. Um, da, da, da. Yeah, you could just inherit from here. I was like, thanks, Lee. <laughs> so that was nice. Um, yeah, that was, that was a great moment that I, I specifically asked if he could help me with something, and then I sorted it in a way, and it's like, yes, it works. And it's like, oh, OK, cool. Um, so you should have told, told me 10 hours early. It's like, whatever. Um, Weird problems along the way, just a couple of them. But the fact that when you've got these sort of free type things, we have ourselves. Um, well, 334 minutes, which is quite nice to have in a time. Um, don't quite know how that happened, but it, it just did. And so we, when, you're, when I was passing through this, even though it had been rendered in some kind of way by Netlify, um, I had to actually, well, like Hugo, uh, I had to actually just account for that and account for all sorts of odd cases like that. My favorite being the article that was published on 111. So that was great. So that was actually from the 1st of January 1. So <laughs> just FYI, uh, that was really fun to know. Um, this is just a really fun thing of just like embedding the own page within an embed of itself. So that was just a recursive page of itself going on forever and ever and ever. I think it's still going on to this day. Um, and this is just showing, so the result of this crawler, which went through all of these pages and stuff like that, um, I also ended up actually automating a good amount. Like, honestly, it's, it, that's a really, really bad way to summarize. I do apologize. Um, but yeah, the vast majority of pages were automatable, and there were some which were just a little bit strange, and it just it was false economy if I was just going to like chug away at doing an automated version when I could just do manually, um, which is always kind of a trade-off. If I had my time again, then it would be really, really lovely to create a more um, generic, genericized version of this, uh, but just for the sake of a 13-week project, it wouldn't be cool. Um, and then finally, having kind of created all this content and got that there, Rendering onboarding process for Nightingale to actually use this website. So created the wiki, created like videos on how to use it. So this is a like a shot of the kind of wiki I made. Um, held the onboarding sessions, did actual user acceptance testing, made sure that, that was all kind of adhered to. Um, had a technical handover with Chris, and that was all round and dandy. And we submitted it. So this ended up being the thing. So we've got backups of the database, backups of the code, the DAC pack, the documentation, and then two videos. Uh, one of them which is just like, <laughs> in your dissertation, you don't actually, like, they don't really look at your finished product, you kind of just make a video showing it. So anyway, so that's, that's nice to know that that's like 13 weeks of one's life. Um, <laughs> and it's submitted, so that, that happened, and I have evidence. I have no idea what mark I've got, so we're assuming great, but uh, <laughs> we have absolutely no idea, but I do have evidence that it's submitted, which is lovely. Um, okay, so a couple of quick things then, because I know I'm overrunning and I'm really sorry. So for anyone who is learning, here are the kind of three um, greatest sources for me, was the actual just documentation, the so single source of truth, and that it can be improved by everyone. Um, again, like with in line to the block list editor criticism I had earlier of the fact that like, you know, while the docs had this, there was a better way. And Lee, Lee described it not unfairly as kind of the left hand and the right hand not really knowing, like, you know, not really speaking in terms of what was now possible. I always implore people who are better than me, please spend time updating documentation with stuff um, because it's really, really easy to be critical of stuff. And then for people like me in isolated situations without anybody else really to ask, 
then it's, it becomes, it makes my life easier. So thank you so much. Um, Scrift is brilliant. Uh, God bless Scrift. Um, I, I generally like doing, focusing more on advanced content and they've got brilliant articles on the DevOps uh, cycle in general. Uh, Aaron Sadler did a really good set of three blogs talking specifically about deploying to Azure. Um, and you know, they, I just think they're really, really great. And then YouTube, inevitably, is a really, really great source of things. Specifically, our good friend Paul Seal here. Um, the uh, series of how to build a website with Umbraco 10 was absolutely a staple. Um, and that was really, really useful. And I'm so, so grateful for Paul in general. But also John D. Jones. Um, so if anyone, do people know who John is? Like, I've seen a couple of his videos. Yeah, seen his videos. So John just kind of, in my opinion, just kind of isn't super involved in the community, but does loads of brilliant videos and really interesting stuff and wrote a book. Like this is a legit book he wrote. And I just, I, yeah, I know. So I really, really credit him. Um, he covers uh, a lot of, a lot of really good, um, he, yeah, he, a lot of really quite advanced topics in my opinion, and is quite opinionated on, on the correct ways of doing things, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, he generally that justifies, but it's certainly quite opinionated. Um, but he was also the person who really helped me understand controllers. Um, I wanted to just highlight this. So this was a path of my learning. Um, I only realized what controllers were properly in about week nine of this project. That's, and then when I realized, oh wait, I can now actually integrate, like, call the code base and do stuff. Like, thank God for that. This is a Mark Goodson post, and I just wanted to like just just clarify and just put my vote in as the most verbose um, helper of the Abraco community in general. Um, so Mark should be paid by the word. Um, and, and him highlighting that I could do this whole, oh, sorry, this is when I was trying to actually create content with the content um, service. And is like there was code snippets, but I had no idea how they actually interacted with reality. Um, and he, and Mark in all of this kind of says, yeah, you could probably just do a controller endpoint. And so then John D. Jones did, has done like this really good half hour video, uh, 28, 20, uh, 2858 um, video on controllers, and it's really really good. And so I will shout from the highest hill of how appreciative I am of that. Uh, sources. Uh, for support and just emotional support. The Umbraco <laughs> community's forums are brilliant for long form reports. Again, God bless Mark. Uh, Discord, increasingly useful. And at the time, Twitter, Stroke X, very good for ranting into the ether and hoping. Um, I had quite a long blog post of the things that I learned very, very quickly and which were wrong, uh, <laughs> which I struggled with, and I was very, very grateful for that. Um, so we're going to have a tale of Joe Blumbeck, uh, and so this is really important because uh, this is to do with uh, attitudes of learning and stuff like that. So Joe had written this article called uh, Umbraco Angular JS Filter Cheat Sheet, and that was super super useful. I found that so so valuable for learning and stuff like that. And then this is us at uh, Code Cabin, and this is Owen here. And there's Joe there, and there's me, and Joe's there, in case anyone's confused about <laughs> it. Um, and then, having met Joe and having read Joe's article, I then felt more, way more comfortable to ask Joe questions about this particular subject matter, which I happen to know was his area. This was just to do with like how you use the back office like um, filters and stuff like that. And so, the pretty much the moral of a tale of Joe uh, Joe Gombat is the idea that I've personally found it much easier to ask for help online after I met them in person. So that is again my constant thing why I think the on uh, in person events are so wonderful. So thank you so much to our hosts as well. So brilliant. Um, so that is my tale of Glombeckian proportions. All right, so the very final thing, just a reflection. I wanted to use Umbraco, so I did. Pretty much, I think there are many solutions I could have done for this dissertation. Um, there are reasons, there are many questionable reasons about why I did things in the particular manner. Um, it's not necessarily just hating on static sites. I mean, I'm currently looking to use Ecstatic far more to create static sites from Umbraco, which I think is brilliant. Um, but yeah, so for this dissertation, I was very, very lucky and fortunate in the fact that I just kind of identified a thing I wanted to learn and my company were comfortable enough to say like, yeah, all right, that can be your dissertation. And it was a workplace dissertation, it was for them. So I'm very grateful for that. I increasingly am um, fascinated by the problem of learning in terms of where problems lie when stuff goes wrong, especially for new starters. It was actually very funny for me. When I, I did this exact, I had this exact slide in Umbraco London about six months ago, and far more of the problems I was having were at the C Sharp and .NET level. And for this project and for my current understanding of Umbraco, absolutely my weakness is AFP.NET Core, like basic MVC uh, principles and how they should be used. Um, that's where I have currently ascended in terms of my pyramid of despair. Um, 
and different ways of getting everything wrong. So again, unsure and best ways to utilize these sort of patterns. Much of it was just written so that it would just work and got, it just got over the line. Um, the version of control, I mean, I didn't have a branching strategy, it was just me. So everything was to master and I felt good. <laughs> um, DevOps, um, I mean, this is a kind of, this is an oversight, I think, though, of just checking that the, how this would work for multiple users. I mean, that's just a note, because then thing. And again, using very, very, very basic Azure resources uh, quite questionably. Um, there was there was certain reasons behind that and sort of budget and price and the lack of any sort of money was good. Um, uh, shout outs to Azure who after about two weeks of complaining have now written off all of my charges which they promised they would do and then billed me anyway. So that was a really fun discussion I've had over the past while. Anyway, um, and the final kind of thought in terms of the Umbraco stuff and in terms of the dissertation is that the best way to learn something is to finish something. Um, this is a really standard uh, idiom or like phrase amongst creatives and like Neil Gaiman or whatever about the fact that like if you are learning something, finishing is by hard, far the hardest thing and then to like, you know, releasing something or just getting to that point. So for me to have worked on a project and then like, cool, so it now exists and it now does the thing. It's really, really good and I strongly recommend that to anyone learning anything ever. So very finally, my constant thing, tech is hard, be excellent to one another and thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.